Hello, everybody. Today on our Four Star podcast, uh, we're going to have a review of the economy and the markets, uh, discussions of the proposals for stimulus spending, the ones in the past and the ones going forward. And then we're going to have uh, at the end a very interesting interview with uh, a, a return guest to the podcast, David Lebovitz. David is the chief global strategist for JP Morgan Asset Management. And he and his colleague, uh, Eric Lewis, are back with us on the podcast later in this session. So why don't we get started? Okay, everybody, welcome to the Four Star Podcast. Uh, Thanks for coming back. We have a full review today of what the markets are doing, uh, and we will... Uh, get about it. We've got our interview as well as I mentioned earlier in the in the pre preamble. Uh, this is Brian Castle. Uh, I'm here again with Mr. Christopher Reardon. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brian. Glad to be here. All right, Chris. Uh, I I was calling Chris sidekick, but actually you're co-host, right? <laughs> okay, that's better. Co-host sounds better. Uh, so Chris is our four-star director of development. I like to call him the master of all things portfolio trading. Uh, reports, uh, still loves his Cleveland Indians, caretaker of his golden doodle puppy, Hudson. Hudson's still alive, Chris? Hudson's still alive. He's still running (laughs) around. (laughs) Very good. And again, I'm founder and CEO and CIO of Four Star Wealth Advisors, Brian Castle. I'm an Eagle Scout, National Boy Scout Foundation trustee, philanthropic advisor, advisor to CEOs and insiders, and chief dad to Quinn and Evan, and husband to the amazing Tripti. Uh, I would ask you all that if you like what you're hearing, uh, give us a review. Give us a five out of five. Um, we love to get five out of fives and, uh, and build our star out in the podcast world. Four Star Podcast is growing. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we've seen dramatic growth in the last year. So uh, pre- please keep adding your listeners. We really uh, enjoy doing this and, and uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun with it here going forward. So, Chris. Let's talk about the markets today. What's going on in the markets now since our last podcast on all the different asset classes? Yeah, so um, a little bit of changes since our last podcast, uh, but domestic equities is still leading the way. Um, It actually gained four points. So we see a little bit of strength coming back to that asset class. Uh, We saw it kind of pull back a little bit over the past month. So it's nice to see it gaining strength again. It's at 321 tally scores. Uh, So it's kind of getting back up to where it was, uh, where it kind of topped out at. Uh, International equities as well in second place gained four points. So the one and two asset classes gained since the last podcast, which is a positive sign. It's at 258, still a little ways back from the number one. Commodities, conversely, uh, lost 12 points. Uh, So it's at 239. So I think the last time we spoke or even a couple podcasts ago, we had kind of a duel going on really for that second place spot between international equities and commodities. We're finally starting to see commodities kind of fade back a little bit. We're seeing international equities gain a little bit of ground again. Uh, Some of that's probably due to oil, uh, you know, Oil's fluctuating again, and that tends to be the big driver there. I think that's one of the big reasons we saw it pop. Um, we're also seeing, you know, broad asset classes or broad commodities, I should say, um, you know, have been strong. But oil tends to be the volatility, uh, a lot of the volatility in that in that asset class. Yes. Uh, fix, yep. The fixed income and fourth uh, moved down one point, uh, so it's at one twenty four now. Uh, cash and fifth gained five points. So I think it was one of the other winners from I think the pullback of commodities was cash. It's at 94 points, still very far off from even moving up into uh, the third position. Um, but so it's in fifth. And then sixth is currencies. Uh, it's been kind of dead in the water, really just slowly moving downwards. It's at 54 points, no change from the last podcast. So we've seen really a continuation of a bull market trend, right? So the two major asset classes gained and everything else just kind of faded a little bit. Yeah. And I would say, you know, the only counter to that would be commodities, but I think commodities you have to take with a grain of salt because I think oil, it's just been so volatile and oil's got caught up with the reopening play. So, I mean, there's a lot of back and forth going on there. So I think, you know, even though it's down 12, it's something you have to take with a grain of salt. Um, yes. It all still kind of plays with exactly a bull market. 
So we're decidedly still in a bull market, but the last couple of weeks had some pretty, pretty interesting and pretty traumatic changes internally. Uh, and that was in the press and everything. There was a, a large uh, hedge fund called Archegos that had a $30 billion margin call. And so that really hurt some of the banks. So a lot of these banks will lend to hedge funds that go out and do speculation. Why, why they do that, I'm not quite sure. Maybe they make a lot of money on it, but then they seem to get hurt. So Credit Suisse and Nomura, the Japanese bank, got really hurt badly in, in the billion dollars, less than Deutsche Bank, and then some of the other investment banks, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, but they managed to clear out some of their positions earlier. But they have all these positions that are, are supported by margin, but when the margin call happens, they have to quickly unload all these things. So they're jumping over each other to sell positions. So uh, we had a lot of weird things that happened during that period of time. So some investors looked at their portfolio and said, gee, why is my portfolio down when the market is up? And this is kind of why it happened, Chris. What what actually happened? Like, what kinds of names got hurt? Yeah, so the you know the uh, hedge fund usually was a mom- they would buy momentum stocks or stocks that were really going higher, uh, which during that time period tended to be kind of consumer discretionary or people would say kind of leisure stocks. So Tesla, as you would imagine, a high flyer. Uh, Six Flags as was another one. I think a lot of the cruise lines they were in, um, and just some names. Um, Generac was another one. Um, names that were just really high flyers and have been, you know, uh, really moving upwards over the past three to four months. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, they just got whacked. It it was one of those, you know, you kind of think of it it as about a a lot of volatility, strong volatility for a week. Uh, But, you know, after kind of the dust settled, you had a lot of buyers come in, you know, it got a heavy offload of selling due to the um, margin call. And then a lot of buyers came in and it, it bounced back relatively quick. Yeah, so, so we're seeing the bounce back now, um, but you know that was pretty traumatic, and we're seeing we saw some things in our portfolios that we're just reacting, and we held on and watched it go down, watched it go back up. So it's kind of a funky time, but it, that seems to mostly be over now. Uh, now the markets have been reacting the last couple of days to J and J taking a timeout for the the vaccine uh, from blood clotting, and the federal government asked them to take a timeout. Uh, But now the market seems to be bouncing back from that episode as well, Chris, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's bouncing back now. I think, you know, we still have the Pfizer, we still have the Moderna out there. Those haven't had problems yet. And, you know, let's be honest. I mean, it's pretty incredible what what we did. I mean, having a vaccine, it's been a year. We already rolled out, you know, millions and millions of doses of these vaccines. It's pretty incredible. I don't think people would believe it if you mentioned it a year ago. So there's going to be hiccups. And I think the J&J, it actually, I think, invested a little bit of confidence uh, with the now existing ones, the Moderna and Pfizer that are out there, because it shows that we're not just pushing this stuff through without actually doing any right. you know, research on it or, you know, we're just, you know, throw it out there and hope it works. Uh, I think it, it gave a little bit of confidence to people that, that they were willing to say, hey, let's pause and let's hold off on this one. Yeah, we did Operation Warp Speed and we accelerated the vaccine creation from three to five years to one year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe it's okay, we take a little bit of a break, but but even with that, the economy is recovering and most people are getting their vaccine. So J&J was only a small percentage of it and and that'll come back when they finally figure that out, hopefully. Um, But turning to the economy, Chris, we had a really interesting CPI number. Well, we expected a half a percent, but it was more than that, right? Uh, so month over month, yeah, I think it was half a percent. Um, it ended up being 0.6%, so it's slightly higher. Um, but year over year, it came in at 2.6%. So, um, you know, that's usually a proxy we use for inflation um, or the government mm-hmm. used for inflation. Uh, you know, I think that was a little higher than expected, but I think over the next couple months, it's something you're, we're gonna have to take with a grain of salt because if you you know, rewind a year ago, we were talking negative oil prices, we were talking, you know, there was some crazy stuff going on from a, from a price perspective. So uh, we're kind of getting back to more normalized now, but if we're, you know, the baseline, the initial reading is extremely low as it was a year ago, and now we're back to normal, it's gonna look a little, uh, little off. So we're gonna have some, rubber banding per se, you know, it's kind of flipping right back up over the next couple of months until things yeah. kind of normalize out and we get more standard readings. Yes. So it, it is interesting though, we're seeing big 
increases in commodity prices and a lot of input prices that don't really show yet show up yet. Uh, but our suspicion is that we're going to see that hit this, the year-over-year -year CPI numbers over the next couple of months as mm -hmm. the input prices come out in goods and services that will be raised, prices will have to go up because of the in input in those prices, unless the producers take the entire increase, which I don't believe they will. So they'll be raising prices, don't you think? Yeah, no, I mean, we definitely will see an increase. Um, I think the increases are going to be a little exaggerated, though. It doesn't mean that we aren't seeing some some inflation or consumer price index rising, uh, but you know it's maybe it was actually up one percent. It's going to be two point six percent. That's factoring in the two point six is a little exaggerated from really what it is, which it, it is increasing. I mean, I think um, you know there's a lot of commodities um, you know that are just you know being raised. Uh, lumber is one of them that's been famously um, that goes into housing building and, and all that stuff. Well, and then the, also during this last podcast period, we had a big disruption in supply line caused by the major ship, the jackknife in the mouth of the Suez Canal. And that was there, that went on for about a week. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we see any long-term effects from that, Chris, or is that mostly a temporary issue? There's definitely going to be impacts. I think the, the problem with it is it just really exacerbated an existing problem, which is the logistic supply chain um, is just extremely backed up right now. Um, you know, I ran into this personally. We had, what, back in January, our refrigerator died. We tried to get a new one, uh, only to, they said it was going to be there in a week, and then they had to reschedule till April, I think about this week, it was like April 27th. You know, so yeah. it's going to take three months for us to get a new refrigerator. So, you know, it, we're not alone in experiences. This has pretty much been across the board in the U.S. It's just the supply chain is extremely backed up. And, and that that ship did not help for sure, uh, getting resources where they need to go, but it's gonna be hard to tell, you know, what was the exact cause of that and what was already ongoing. Yes, yes, well, we'll see. Uh, that, you know, is that pandemic effect or is that the Suez Canal effect? Hard to tell, but uh, <laughs> things are slowly coming back to life. Uh, Chris, you've got numbers on the jobless claims and the March job growth as well, right? I want to yeah, review yeah. those. All right. We had two good numbers there. Um, the U.S. Uh, the the job numbers came out um, it was huge. Nine hundred sixteen thousand jobs were added in March, which is uh, really the uh, best gain since August. So really, kind of the best gain since back when we were really looking at almost reopening at that point, and kind of then we had a little bit of a resurgence. Uh, but un unemployment fell to six percent, which is a good number. I mean. You know, if you guys remember pre-pandemic, we were in more of the two, three percent. But I think it's it's important to put those in context too, because we we're kind of getting used to those. But those were record low unemployment numbers. You know, I think if we can get to three, four, even almost four, five percent, you know, a lot of people before we hit those two, that was considered full employment. Uh, so yeah. being at six percent now and accelerating is a good place to be. You know, I think, like you said, Brian, we're starting to get back to uh, a little bit more normalized, um, you know, jobs numbers. Uh, the jobless claims numbers came out. They fell to 576 last week. Um, the week prior to that, so kind of the Easter week, uh, they were 769. So we're seeing those start to drop, um, you know, really fast, which is, once again, another uh, really good data point and really just shows that we're seeing an acceleration in hiring. Um, we're seeing those unemployment numbers really start to drop. Okay, and how about March job growth? March yeah. job growth, that's right. I said 916, oh. 916,000. That brings it in at 6%. 6%. Um, now, retail sales was up big too, which I thought was really neat. Yeah, that actually just came out uh, recently this week. We had retail sales come at 9.8%, uh, which is huge. And I think this is something, this is a trend we're going to continue to see is you know, we have these vaccinations, uh, vaccines um, being rolled out. And as people get vaccinated, I think people are getting a little more comfortable in going to restaurants and, you know, traveling a little bit more. Um, I know the CDC has been kind of pushing back against this and stuff, but I think it's inevitable. Uh, people are kind of pent up. Uh, there's certainly pent up uh, kind of demand to want to travel. And I think as people get vaccinated, they feel a lot more comfortable. They feel like, hey, they can go out and do these with a little bit more safety. Added yeah. to it. So, um, you know, we did see retail sales up 9.8% last month. 
Uh, it was huge bounce back. And it, you know, the next closest was actually May of last year when we had kind of a similar feeling, right? We had those yeah. initial lockdowns and the lockdowns were finally starting to lift in May. So, um, you know, I don't know if the next number will be quite as big, but we will see large numbers as people get vaccinated. And they feel a lot more comfortable going out, spending and, you know, taking trips. Yes. Well, then the other the other really interesting economic effect we've seen is home prices. And there's been lots of talk. We've had uh, anecdotally, many people have had friends or uh, maybe they uh, have sold a home themselves. And we've seen uh, home prices rising. January of 2021, home prices hit an all time record in America. But it's interesting, though, normally, like in the 2003 to 2006 period before the uh, real estate recession the last time, uh, we saw strong demand uh, with good supply, but it managed to push prices up like normal, really strong um, market. But what we're seeing now, we're seeing uh, strong demand and regular demand, but no supply, very limited supply. So most of the real estate firms, including my wife's firm talk, how there's a limited number of, of listings. So um, if you remember that supply demand graph from Economics 101, the supply curve shifts backward uh, and that shift, the less supply and that raises prices. So, um, you know, will the prices hold up when the normal market kind of, you know, supply demand conditions return? Uh, it could, right? So we, we could see a, a, a bump in prices that normalizes a new level at a higher level, and then we have a normalized market that develops up there. So it could be a permanent increase in, in prices, uh, unless we have obviously some sort of a sell-off in prices, but that doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. So that's what we're seeing here. We're not seeing enormous demand, we're seeing very limited supply and essentially normal demand. So, uh, but prices are rising. People are paying above listing for properties. It's pretty amazing uh, what's out there. So. Anyway, and then uh, didn't the IMF have some projections, Chris, I think you had on China and the US? Yeah, so the IMF came out um, with their kind of projections for global growth. Uh, and they came in at uh, 6% for this coming year. Uh, and that the big driver, and, and I guess could put that into context, going back, the next closest number and time we were in, the, in that number range was 1980. So we're about four decades is the last time they were projecting global growth to be close to 6%. Uh, the big drivers behind that were uh, the U.S., which they projected to grow at 6.4%, and China, they, they projected to grow at 8.4%. Mm -hmm. Once again, these are just projections, but it does show the fact that, you know, we had such a rough up and down year last year. Um, this year, as these vaccines roll out, not only in the U.S., but globally, uh, we're going to see things really start to accelerate very quickly, kind of almost like a catch-up uh, year, yeah. if you will, uh, from an economic standpoint. Well, and, and so many people have said, you know, the markets are running really fast and hard here. And, and a lot of that has to do with all the money that's been put into the system. You know, uh, close to $12 trillion now with the new spending plan. If, if it gets passed, it'll be close to $14 trillion of new money. And not all immediately, but over the near term but it's uh, expectations plus the money that's flowing into the markets now. But if those projections, Chris, of you know, China 8.4%, US 6.4%, you know, above normal growth, then maybe if you do carry those numbers all the way through to the math of earnings, earnings will be higher than expected. And then the multiple, the stock market multiple, which is fair value at about 17 to 18, call it 17 and a half times earnings, we're about 20 times earnings now, that multiple may actually compress a bit. So then the earnings would, would bring the market back to a lower multiple than before, unless of course the market you know, goes to 40,000 overnight here. Uh, but based on where we are, uh, maybe the market isn't wildly overvalued, like some people are saying, and will continue to go um, a growth from here. And then hopefully that growth will continue into future years and the market will be on a normalized path. So, you know, we hear this all the time. Is the market really wildly overvalued? Are we getting ready for a crash? Uh, you know, it doesn't appear to be that way. And usually when we're in economic recoveries anyway, 
That's not when market crashes or big downturns develop. At any given time in a market growth period, you can see 10 to 15% pullbacks in the, in the market, uh, just when the buying is exhausted and sellers step in to pull some things out of the market. That happens in a normal rising market, of course. But as far as a major 30, 40, 50% decline, these are not the conditions that would normally lead to that. So we don't see that as a huge risk right now. But uh, the key is, is the market wildly overvalued? And, and with the earnings coming in, it appears that it might not be as some people are fearing. So, so we'll see what develops, Chris, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the other important thing is to point out is right now where certain, especially certain stocks like a Six Flags or even a lot of the cruise lines, you know, yes, they're going back upwards in price and, and people are projecting cash flow, uh, but we're projecting it to reopen. We're projecting earnings to actually, yeah, come in a lot higher because, you know, a lot of these cruise lines haven't had earnings the past year. So, you know, are they overvalued for current? Yes, but are they overvalued for the future cash flows that they're expecting with the openings. And hopefully, as Brian said, the earnings as they start to you know, come in, they start to get more cash flow. Um, you know, it, I think where we are valued now is, is optimistic of the opening. And then it seems like we are on track for that. Yes. Well, um, so going forward, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to, to think about in regard to how the, how the recovery is going. And the recovery could be very robust or it could be less robust depending on how we do it. Uh, I saw a very interesting interview with Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School, and he had some interesting comments I wanted to share with everybody today. You know, um, going forward after we did this recent stimulus plan that was a COVID plan, but really it was only about 10% COVID and a lot of other spending that doesn't even hit till 2022, 2023 and beyond. Um, now we're proposing an infrastructure plan of 2.2 trillion, and it's really not so. It's not an infrastructure plan. Only about 10%, if you use a loose definition, is actually infrastructure, roads and bridges and buildings and things like that. So it's actually only about 6%. Um, so you know, any spending that is designated to stimulate the economy could be um, upgrading of our infrastructure, but this proposal is, is really neither, there's not enough of it. So it neither really stimulates the economy nor creates any kind of a wealth effect. So also the issue, uh, the proposal of using corporate taxes to fund it reduces productivity and really does nothing to stimulate growth and create wealth. Uh, if the idea is about productivity, then fine, but this clearly is not. And social spending is merely transfer payments that offer no stimulus. So they don't spur growth to pay for themselves. So we have to pay for all this spending directly, either through new taxes that are regressive in this case, or by adding debt if they don't get the taxes passed. So another setup um, spending is to, you know, perhaps do something different like uh, a, an incentive tax like you know, maybe a carbon tax, for example, would be something that might work better and it would create the right incentives. And then also training and spending money on training and upgrading skills. So that would also create a, a, a basically a productivity effect. So it's really not much of a change except transfer payment spending. And you know, some are saying it's a weak partisan response. Um, I'll leave that to, to you to determine, but clearly, you know, if the administration would like to take political credit for a good economy, they could actually create a good economy through creating incentives, and then they could get credit for that. But it seems they're going in the direction of spending money that isn't necessarily growing the economy, but getting credit for the spending and, and all their supporters, you know, getting benefits and that kind of thing. So that's another way to do it, but it's not helping grow the economy. So tax increases that are corporate tax increases tend to depress investment. And they also lower asset prices. So companies are valued based on a multiple of cash flow, like in the stock sense, dividends and you know, earnings more loosely. So higher taxes simply reduces those asset values and therefore can reduce the value of the stock market. So that's the big risk here is the type of taxes they're proposing could actually cause trouble for the stock market if it passes in its current form and then it flows through the economy. 
So tax increases, um, you know, that they're proposed have a much higher distributional effect, causing less employment, and also hurting low and middle income and, and taxpayers. You know, they're claiming that it's mostly, you know, let's soak the rich, anyone more than 400,000, but it, does, it doesn't do that. It actually affects the low and, in, and middle income folks as well. So hopefully the president understands this. If he doesn't understand it, then, then that's a shame. Um, but if they do understand it and they have other objectives, but either way, they're not talking, which is also another frustrating aspect of this that we're not hearing from the administration. They're just announcing their plans and justifying it without really having an honest discussion. So that's you know a little bit frustrating. Um, Moody's, uh, Mark Zandi is claiming that this bill would create 19 million jobs and Goldman Sachs is pro projecting more than 7% growth this year. We're already on track for six, but, but I think neither of these are really serious claims. We've never come close to creating 19 million jobs out of a stimulus bill. Uh, we talked about job, you know, shovel ready jobs in the 2009 stimulus. And of course, none of that actually materialized. So one of the leaders of the US Senate, uh, Roy Blunt has suggested, why don't we just pass a $600, trillion, $600 billion infrastructure bill and be done with it if that's what we're saying we're going to do. Then we can go back and look at spending that will actually create a wealth effect, create incentives, and grow the economy. People have heard of this term, the multiplier. You spend a dollar, it creates two and three dollars after that. That's the kind of spending that we really need and not the regressive type. So we'll see what they do there, Chris. Um, you know, uh, in the what we see uh, department out there this week, we're also seeing some IPOs. Uh, didn't Coinbase do like a, a listing, right? Not a full IPO. Yeah, yeah. So um, biggest news yesterday, I think, was the Coinbase, and I, a lot of people were talking about it. Um, you know, I think the important thing to point out is it was a direct listing, not necessarily an IPO. Uh, so a direct listed at three eighty two uh, per share. Uh, it actually ended up by the end of the day at close trading down to I think it was three. It was at three twenty eight. Look at my number there. Um, so, you know, what does that mean? Um, a direct listing differs from an IPO where you're not creating new shares. So, you know, if you own shares of Coinbase, whether through a private venture or something, you could just sell it on the open market, essentially. Uh, so there's no new influx of money coming into Coinbase because, you know, that was, people have already invested five years ago or whenever they invested. Um, but, you know, you're still getting in, you know, the shares going on the market, the public can purchase it. An IPO, usually the company creates new shares, like maybe take 30% of the company, create new shares and sell 30% of the company to the public market, which brings in an influx of cash. So it's kind of differs slightly for most people's view because they just see it, you know, what's trading in the market. It's not going to change too much there. Uh, but I think the cool thing is, is um, with what it closed at at 328, uh, it was actually in the top 150 most valuable companies in the U.S. ahead of NASDAQ, Discovery Financial. So, I mean, it is a behemoth of a company uh, for sure now. Now going from the private markets to a public environment. So it's valued in the top 150. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and the reason uh, they claim the reason they did a direct listing instead of an IPO, which is more traditional, is they didn't want to you know, cheat the, the public out of it because, you know, when you do IPOs, you have investment bankers in there. They get, you know, you have, it, so there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say corruption, but there's a lot of this uh, conceived corruption with it. Uh, so, you know, I think they were trying to appeal more towards the millennial younger generation, which tends to gravitate towards these um, cryptocurrencies and everything. So I think it was kind of some ways a play towards that. Um, but it's really interesting to see that they, you know, um, that they came out with it via direct listing. Yeah, direct listing is very different for those who haven't really been involved with initial public offerings or IPOs. Usually what they do is they have a certain number of shares that are listed uh, that are sold to the public in the offering but they actually sell many more shares than the prospectus says, because then the investment bankers sit there on the bid buying shares back. So 30 days after the offering, if there's 10 million shares that were filed for, they actually sell 15 million and buy 5 million back, but they use that to stabilize the price. 
So that's, I think, what you're talking about with the manipulation. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a uh, manipulation game, essentially, that goes on with IPOs, but that's how they stay up there. No one wants to own an initial public offering that goes down. And since it's a new stock, if it goes down, people will just say, ah, it's a dog and let me just sell this thing. So everyone, everyone sells and they run the stock down 30, 40%. We saw it with Facebook in 2005, uh, not 2000, maybe 2014. They came, yeah. it came out by 2013, something like that, uh, and a few others. But um, you know, now I think there was some buying pressure put on the Coinbase stock because it did rise right after the offering yeah. and it just listed it without any any stimulus uh, on the downside, the stock might've gone down. So they did have something going on there, but it wasn't quite like the old IPO. No, exactly. And I think exactly what you pointed out. I think the, the problem with IPOs that they were thinking is transparency. I think they, there's definitely, you know, that, that transparency there. So uh, yeah. it's, it's really interesting and we'll see how it's trading. I think I, I looked this morning, it was up a little bit today at like 3.33. So we'll see kind of now that it's in the general public markets, how it trades. I think the other thing I, you know, that I had um, you know, talked about kind of on a similar is, um, you know, Coinbase and uh, these cryptocurrencies are based on blockchain technology. And last yeah. week we actually had, um, you know, for the first time, we actually had a transaction in the uh, stock exchange kind of via blockchain. So we yeah. had two companies, which you had mentioned earlier, uh, that have been in the news for negative, being Credit Suisse and uh, a Nomura, Nomura holding yeah. uh, brokerage. Uh, they actually did a transaction of a couple of US equity stocks. Instead of having a transfer agent and all that, they used blockchain uh, to verify the transaction, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. kind of cool, because this is, you know, when cryptocurrencies originally came out, this was, you know, a lot of people were saying, ah, we don't know what's going to happen with Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, but blockchain is the real power behind this, you know, being able to, you know, trade something by making sure that the counterparty actually has the asset and that you're not, you know, giving something to someone for nothing. Um, yes. So what this will actually possibly do, um, you know, down the line, if this is able to be replicated and able to be scaled is, you know, it'll allow the, you know, when you buy a stock, everything to settle a lot quicker. So you know, if you buy a stock, sometimes it takes two to three days to, to settle, to really yeah. actually fully be there uh, before you could sell it. So settlement will be essentially instantaneous. It'll allow fees to come down. A lot of these large, um, you know, exchanges or large hedge funds that buy and sell stocks, you know, now they can do it very quickly with very minimal costs and not having to sit and wait on something for three or four days. So it's going to be really the efficiencies that'll bring to, to the market are going to be really interesting to see uh, yeah. if we see this start to scale and play out. So technology has changed everything. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, well, Chris, there's a, another really interesting oddity of the current environment is after the worst possible year for the travel industry, hotels, uh, airlines, we had two airlines going public. So Sun Country and Frontier. So that's a signs of a consumer recovery, but it's also a sign of a change in tastes and habits. So people that might normally have taken the other big airlines, United American or whatever, they're taking lower cost airlines like Frontier or Sun Country. And you know that's a change in habits essentially, but they felt strong enough in their demand now coming out of the pandemic that they were able to go public a lot of the other airlines are just struggling with heavy debt and things like that. So um, we'll hope the airline industry, you know, does better here. But uh, Sun Country and Frontier coming public shows a, a big change in how people are consuming travel as we come out of this. And a couple of other just interesting stories. Uh, some of the old timers might remember the name G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon Liddy uh, was a New York, Poughkeepsie, New York, public official actually ran in a primary for Congress and lost in 1968, but caught the eye of uh, one President Nixon who asked him to run the narcotics and guns division uh, for the federal government. And he became a leader in the Republican party at that time under Nixon. And they, and anybody who was around that time remember the dirty tricks campaigns that went on uh, with, with President Nixon led it leading to the Watergate break-in. And he was an official in the committee to re-elect the president, uh, affectionately known as Creep. And uh, so G. Gordon Liddy unfortunately passed 
at 90 uh, this past week. Uh, and then also uh, CEO Trevor Milton of Nicola Manufacturing, which is the truck version of the uh, the um, so the uh, battery uh, battery cars. That's a truck version, like Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, he's making in trouble for making uh, inappropriate statements on Twitter about his company, uh, inflammatory statements, kind of like what Elon Musk did uh, a summer and a half ago. So they all seem these tech uh, CEOs seem to have trouble uh, dealing with the public markets and not saying inflammatory things. To the public and tweet and tweet so we got to be careful with that stuff so um anyway that's all we have today chris right yeah i think that covers it excellent well thanks everybody for being with us um i just wanted to put in a commercial here just remember uh tell your friends to subscribe to the four star podcast it's called today's market explained a four star podcast it's available on spotify uh, apple itunes google podcast stitcher and actually the number one podcast company was which is iHeartRadio also um, and and as I've said in the past I guess we're a hit in Brazil we're seeing more international listeners uh, so anyway write us a kick-ass review give us a five out of five and all the work that we talk about with the four star models we have a great team of advisors here at four star who will give you access to our research and models and our methodology and our award-winning platform so if you're interested in in being part of this, uh, go on our site and you can you can get us your information that way, uh, fourstarwealth.com, or you can call us at our direct line 312-667-1750 and uh, you know, tell us what you're interested in. We would love to help you. Uh, and and uh, that's really pretty much it. So for um, our great team, on behalf of Laura, uh, my friend here, Mr. Christopher Reardon, uh, Chris Wannenberg, um, Brian, Tucker, and Karen on the East Coast. We are signing off until the next podcast, uh, but stay tuned though, not for, not for the whole podcast, stay tuned for the interview with uh, David Lebovitz. Uh, very interesting, very smart strategist, very well-spoken man. And I look forward to uh, you listening to that with us uh, just after this. Bye everybody. <laughs> Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Four Star Podcast. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a very interesting set of guests for us today to talk about the economy and what's going on. What an interesting subject. Uh, we've got Eric Lewis from JP Morgan and the Chief Global Strategist with us, uh, David Lebovitz. Uh, and along with me today, uh, doing the interrogation, will be <laughs> Christopher Reardon. Welcome, Chris, as well. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Welcome, all of you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So, um, you know, the same old the same old subject keeps going on and on. You know, we've got this recovering economy, and you know, now now maybe the market's too high. People are getting nervous, uh, but then people are jumping in, and then then we see these little side issues of GameStop and Bitcoin and all kinds of crazy things going on. Dave, what is what is going on? Can you tell our podcast listeners the economy? What is going on? Sure. So, you know, I, I think that on the one hand, what's going on in the economy is, is all very positive. You know, we, we're slowly but surely getting the virus under control. Uh, that is allowing us to, to bring things back online. And I think when all is said and done, you know, we could very well see a seven and a half percent year from a growth standpoint, from an economic growth standpoint, uh, which in real terms would be the most robust pace of annual growth um, that's been observed since, since the early 1950s. And so, you know, the, the economy is certainly firing or, or on the cusp of firing on all cylinders here. And we think that by the fourth quarter of this year, economic conditions uh, will be downright boomy. I, I would argue though, that, that a lot of this good news ha has been priced into the market. Uh, over the course of the past 12 months. You know, I think the last time you had me on and really for the better part of the last year, we, we were talking about how the market demonstrated this willingness to, to look through COVID because it was an inherently finite episode. And so I think, you know, we're beginning to see what the market was focused on. And while we still see room for, for equities to trend higher in the year end, you know, I do think that you're going to see a bit more differentiation in performance. I think that what's been observed here over the past couple of months 
in terms of value versus growth, just to draw, you know, very broad lines in the sand, um, could likely persist. You know, value seems to be pausing to catch its breath. Growth seems to be acting a little bit better, but we do think that over the remainder of the year, long-term rates will rise, uh, and that will support the outperformance of, of value relative to growth. So, still constructive, but becoming a bit more nuanced in our view relative to, to where we were, uh, say, late last year or, or earlier on in uh, in this year. So, so Dave, the question we get in like this is, you know, maybe we'll have a correction, but do you think we have a major crash? I think the conditions are right for a, like a big decline, 40, 50% kind of a decline. So I, I think that a, a significant de significant decline to the tune of 30, 40, 50% is, is probably a little bit of a stretch. I mean, taking a step back, right, the economy is recovering, fiscal policy is supportive, the Fed could not be more dovish. And so I think that it would be challenging to see a big pullback in that type of environment. But I do think that as we get closer to, you know, the economy actually being reopened, uh, which we gauge is going to be sometime around the middle of the summer, you, you could very well see kind of a run of the mill 10 to 20, 10 to 15 rather uh, percent pullback in, in equities. And what I would remind everybody who's, who's listening is that, you know, it sounds a little bit scary, particularly given we've had about six months here where we haven't really seen a meaningful pullback in, in risk assets and in equity markets. But that type of volatility is frankly quite normal. The, the average intra-year decline since 1980 has been 14.3%. And then more than 75% of the time, the market has gone on to finish the year in positive territory. And so I view you know, a, a pullback during the summer as a very healthy development and something that would actually set markets up for a pretty solid back half in, in 2021. Nice, you know, your CEO was uh, quoted uh, in his recent letter, uh, in this somewhat of a Goldilocks type of comment, right? Is that- Yeah, no, I, th I think that that's, that's it's a reasonable way to, to kind of characterize the, the current environment. You know, everything feels like it's going pretty well. People know somebody who's gotten their shot if they haven't gotten their first one themselves. The economy is improving. We created almost a million jobs in the month of March. The, the Fed is easy and, you know, there's more fiscal support coming in the form of infrastructure. So very much in that, that Goldilocks environment that, you know, we, we found ourselves in on a number of occasions over the course of the, uh, of the past decade. But I think it's important for, for investors to make sure that they're still looking forward and looking far enough forward to realize that while the good times may last here into the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, you know, at some point here, we will return to the, the trend growth environment of 2% that we were in for the better part of the prior expansion. Now, that's not me saying that it's necessarily going to happen tomorrow, but more a recognition that eventually we get back to, to that steady state. And so for a lot of folks who are you know, very enthusiastic about the value trade and the cyclical trade, we still think it's important to remain balanced and not necessarily you know, stop allocating to those secular growth stories, but rather be a bit more balanced between the two as you think about building portfolios in the current environment. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, in the, uh, podcast listeners might remember the reference to Goldilocks. About 15 years ago, we had a Goldilocks economy, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. But it might have actually related to the temperature of their of uh, Jamie Dimon's porridge, maybe, at breakfast. We'll see. Um, nonetheless, Chris, did you have any? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, um, I think kind of all along the lines of that, and one of the hot topics I think nowadays is inflation. Uh, how do you see that kind of representing kind of in the coming months? I know it's been really all over the news, and I think that's one of the fears that could drive that, you know, 20%, 15%, whatever it is, you know, possible pullback in the near term. So well, what do you kind of see out there from an inflation perspective? So when it comes to inflation, you know, the, the real question is, is over what time period? And when we think about the long run, so call it the next 10 to 15 years, we, we really don't think inflation is going to be too much of a problem. Um, we think that a lot of the structural forces that have weighed on inflation over the course of the past couple of decades, you know, things like income inequality, demographics, globalization, the, the broad-based adoption of technology, 
you know, all of this should continue to, to keep price growth pretty muted in, in the longer term. But we do recognize, and we actually saw the beginnings of it uh, in this morning's CPI report, that inflation is going to pick up here uh, over the course of the next couple of months and, and then again into the end of 2021. And the way that I think about it is, you know, over the, the April and May period, uh, that was when inflation bottomed out in 2020. And so the year over year comparisons are, are quite easy. And that's going to make inflation look like it's running a bit hotter uh, than perhaps is, is actually the case. We think inflation will settle back down over the course of the summer months, but it could very well remain north of that key 2% level before reaccelerating into the end of 2021 uh, and the beginning of 2022. And you know, the, the, the way that I think about it is inflation is kind of like economic sweat, right? If you go to the gym and you run on the treadmill for 20 minutes, chances are that, that you're going to perspire. You know, the U.S. is, is a 2% economy in the long run, but we're going to grow at 7.5% this year. And so one would expect with that robust rate of growth for a little bit of inflation to, to begin to show up. But again, we're, we're very much aligned with the Fed on this one in terms of this inflation being transitory and longer term finding ourselves back in that environment that we were in for the better part of the post-GFC period. Interesting. And, and I guess even playing on that a little bit, um, you talked a little bit about, you know, globalization. Um, I know recently, especially we've had some kind of geopolitical events and we've seen um, from the international front kind of certain areas heating up. Uh, what do you kind of see from an international perspective uh, coming into 2021 uh, and even throughout the year coming into 2022? So we're still fairly, fairly constructive on, on international assets and, and international equities in particular. We, we think that the dollar may not just blindly weaken into the end of this year. We think it's probably going to be a bit more range bound, given how robust growth in the U.S. looks set to be. And given that rates here uh, are higher than, than the rest of the developed world. But, you know, even if the dollar is, is call it range bound, we do expect global growth to become increasingly synchronized. We do believe that the current administration is gonna take more of a, a textbook approach to foreign policy than perhaps what we saw over the past four years uh, under President Trump. And furthermore, when we think about you know, the underlying fundamental drivers of growth, populations in the emerging world in particular are, are much younger than, than what we have in the developed world. And longer term, that should be a really nice tailwind for the overall pace of, of economic growth. And so we, we recognize that relative valuations are attractive. I mean, to be blunt, relative valuations have been attractive for the better part of the past 10 years. And that hasn't really mattered uh, when it comes to performance. We do believe that valuations still are appealing, but the overall backdrop is becoming much more constructive. And that's what's driving a lot of our enthusiasm around international equities quite broadly, uh, but particularly around EM and specifically Southeast Asia. That to us is a huge area of opportunity, uh, particularly for, for long-term investors. Excellent. Uh, I, I had another thought, David, maybe to get your view on this. We, we have a lot of investors that call up and ask us about all the really interesting behavior that's going on right now. And does that mean that we're at a signal? Does this signal anything? Like, for example, I think seven, some 7 million people bet on sports games and DraftKings recently. Uh, we've seen Bitcoin hit a, hit a new high take a dive now at another new high in the mid sixties. Uh, you know, we're seeing crazy speculation and things like GameStop since we had you on our podcast last, uh, we, we tend to have an opinion on that, but I wondered what JP Morgan and you thought about all that, you know, strange behavior sometimes doesn't make national press, but lately it has. Does this mean? Yeah. So I, I think that this is a direct function of, of too much liquidity. You know, we, we've pumped trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars into the system, uh, both the economy and the financial markets 
over the course of the past 12 months. And when you have an environment where, where there's a lot of money chasing a, a limited pool of assets, right, you start to see this, this speculative and kind of excessive behavior uh, begin to begin to bubble up. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that this poses a systemic risk to the financial system, right? What we've seen in some of these small cap names, what we've seen in terms of the amount of leverage being used in certain funds, right? These do appear to be relatively isolated incidents, but I do think it's a reflection of what I've deemed uh, liquidity pimples, right? When there's too much liquidity in the system, you start to see bumps show up on the surface, little pockets of froth, and that's very much what we've seen uh, over these past couple of months. And you know, I think that the takeaway for investors is that risk management matters in bull markets too. Right. We spend most of our time talking about protecting on the downside and, you know, to the question earlier, when are we going to see volatility and maybe what can we do in portfolios to, to offset that? Um, even when markets are trending higher, we, we still need to be cognizant of our underlying exposures and the underlying risks that we're taking on, because as we've seen, people can trip themselves up even when things are trending higher. And so, you know, doing your homework still matters. And I actually think it's going to matter more and more here going forward because we're very much going to see the market start to transition away from being very macro driven, right? All about the Fed and the virus and fiscal policy to being more micro driven. And, you know, what I mean by that is, frankly, earnings are going to matter more. And so it's going to be about following those cash flows and focusing on the fundamentals rather than the kind of, you know, very binary trading environment uh, that we were in for the better part of last year. Yeah. You know, you mentioned about some of those asset classes that are running, and we haven't seen some of those run in a while, like small caps are having a, a good little renaissance here. Uh, but one, one that a lot of struck, struck the fancy of a lot of our investors are commodities. We really haven't had a strong commodity cycle since 2010, a little bit of a rally in 2015. Other than that, it's been a uh, bear market all the way. But recently, we've seen some interesting moves. We're invested in things like copper and, and cotton and you know, the carbon trust and maybe a little bit of gold. Uh, what do you what do you think about commodities here? And you know, what do you think is going to happen? Of course. So, um, you know, I do see room for, for commodities to continue acting pretty well here. I, I think a big part of what's driven performance in recent months has been the fact that during the pandemic, uh, manufacturing was was effectively able to continue operating right? Industry was, was able to continue running. It was really services that got put on the back burner. And so you saw people, you know, if they used to consume a hundred dollars worth of goods and services every month, now they consumed a hundred dollars worth of goods because they couldn't consume any services. And so that that's led to some pricing pressures, you know, the, the bottlenecks that we've seen uh, have not necessarily helped. And so I think that there's room for commodities to continue trending higher, you know, as we proceed here into an economy that, that comes back online, as people are able to consume services once again, maybe that, that softens up. But in terms of the, the very near term, I still think that commodities have room to run. Um, I do push back a little bit on the idea that we've embarked on a new commodity super cycle. I know some folks have written about how we may see commodities do what they did in the early 2000s over the next couple of years. Um, I don't buy it. You know, China is not going to represent the source of demand that it did in the early 2000s. And so it's going to be very difficult to see that same type of price action here going forward. But I do believe, and back to the question about inflation, that commodities are a very effective hedge against rising prices. And if we see inflation in aggregate begin to pick up, that could very much allow this run that commodities are on uh, to continue. And furthermore, from an investment perspective and a portfolio perspective, the historical relationship is right about 10 to 1. So for every 1% move, move you've seen in headline inflation, historically, you've seen about a 10% move in a diversified basket of commodities. And so as we think about ways of, of hedging against the risk that inflation maybe does take off here in a way that we are not expecting, commodities certainly fit the bill uh, quite, quite nicely. And the, and the other big question was real estate. Now we've seen panic buying in the suburbs. We've seen people leaving high tax states to low tax states. Uh, and uh, we actually put out a blog post recently about 
how some people are actually starting to regret uh, that they jumped in and they were getting in the fray and everyone buying and bidding houses up. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about real estate prices here? Is it just another commodity play or city, you know, leaving the city's play? What, what, what do you make of all this? So I, and what's really interesting is if you look at some charts that, that just illustrate housing activity in the United States, um, housing has kind of emerged from, from its 10 year slumber. Um, you know, in the, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, housing really never got up back and running or back up and running, I should say, um, to the extent that it was in the pre GFC period. Um, you know, I'm guilty of exactly what, what you described. My, my family and I left New York City uh, and moved to a house in the suburbs, which as you can see from the wall behind me, we are still uh, in the process of, of doing some renovations. But I think that this all ties back to, to one central theme, which is that, you know, the office isn't going away, but the way we work is going to be more flexible going forward. And so you've seen as a result of that, housing preferences begin to shift. I mean, look, Chicago will always be Chicago. New York will always be New York. San Francisco will always be San Francisco. But if you're not expected to be in the office 12 hours a day, five days a week, do you really need to live in those urban centers with, with, with such close proximity to exactly where it is that you work? Um, I think that the answer to that is no. And my general take here is that COVID didn't necessarily bring any new forces into play as it pertains to real estate, but rather accelerated trends that, that were already in place. And, you know, I think about my, my own situation, we had anticipated on staying in the city for a couple of more years, but always kind of thought that the burbs would be the, uh, the, the end location that got sped up by COVID. And I think that that's a lot of what's driven the, the somewhat crazy housing activity uh, that you alluded to in, in the question, you know, the house on the corner from us, it was on the market for a day uh, and already has been, has been purchased. Um, I think that that is going to ebb here as we get back to normalcy because people will go back to the cities, right? It's just something that might take a little bit of time as those urban centers get, get back up and running. So maybe the cities are a good value now. So it's, it's interesting, certainly a good value from a rental perspective. I, I know some of the deals we're seeing in New York, you know, three months free, uh, so on and so forth. Interestingly, the, the purchase market remained relatively resilient, um, not necessarily in the tails of the distribution, but, but kind of in, in more of the, the center. And so you didn't see prices collapse uh, necessarily the way that, that folks might have expected. And I think that that's because, again, this was just a transition that was accelerated rather than some new force being being brought into uh, into play. Interesting. Chris, any other thoughts? Yeah, and I think the one thought I have too is do you think that, I, I think when I think of the housing, what's going on now and prices rising, I think of it as supply and demand issue. You have this big demand, not enough supply. And I think with that, you have a lot of home building going on right now. You know, people are trying to up that, that supply. So do you think that is having a little bit of an impact on the commodities? I know I've seen lumber prices be, you know, skyrocketing, skyrocketing upwards, things like that. So do you see that? And do you think ultimately, like you said, are they overbuilding now? So, you know, three or four years down the line, we're going to have now this oversupply with not enough demand as people kind of decide, hey, maybe I want to move back into the city or, you know, you know, something like that. I'm not sure that we're necessarily overbuilding, but but I do think that the housing story does tie into some of what you're seeing uh, with certain commodity prices. Again, it's the fact that over the past year, I can consume a house, but I can't necessarily go sit down at a restaurant and consume a cheeseburger and a beer. And so be, because of that availability aspect, right, people have been able to consume physical things and not services, that definitely ties into that broader narrative. And I would agree is a big part of the reason why input prices have been rising. And I mean, it's, it's been most evident in the recent PMI surveys, particularly the manufacturing survey, you know, the, the input cost sub-index is just skyrocketing. And it's a function of the fact that there's a lot of demand for stuff uh, but unfortunately, a, a somewhat limited supply. And so I, I don't think that this ends badly in the sense of, you know, another housing bubble like we saw in the early 2000s. Uh, but I do, you know, it's I'm, I'm living it firsthand. It takes 10 weeks 
to get a, a faucet and handles because everybody's trying to renovate their bathroom. And so it's going to take time to work through this. And in the interim, we could very well see prices remain, uh, remain somewhat elevated. Interesting. Nice. Interesting. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. I, I think, uh, you know, may, maybe there's a general thought you'd have for partners as we, as we finish our discussion here, David, any general things you think we missed or just find messages to give? So, Sure. So I, I guess what I would want to leave all of our all of our listeners with is, you know, we've we've come very far, very fast. And, and the one thing that really ha has caught me by surprise during the, the course of the pandemic is just the speed with which things have moved. And, you know, if you look from March 23rd of 2020 to March 23rd of 2021, it was the best 12 months for the S&P 500 um, going back to the pre-1950s. And so I think we need to take stock of where we've been and make sure we understand where we're going. You know, it is going to be more challenging to generate the, the rates of return that clients need going forward. And we don't think that that means you shouldn't invest, but rather we think that it means you need to paint with broader brush strokes and you need to realize that there is a broad color palette available to you as an investor, right? It's not just about owning large cap US stocks and high quality US bonds. It's about owning things like small caps. It's about owning things like international equities. It's about owning things like high yield, for certain clients owning things like alternatives and real estate, right? There are a number of different levers that we can pull in the current environment and the prudent investor will make sure that they're pulling those levers in order to allow themselves to generate that rate of return that they need to successfully accomplish their long-term retirement goals. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's great advice. We really appreciate uh, both you gentlemen being with us here on the podcast and, and uh, we're getting uh, a lot of listeners all around the world and uh, we appreciate, uh, they're gonna love your comments. So appreciate it very much. And I hope to have you. So. Yep, I'm looking forward to coming back soon. Thanks again for having me. All right. Me. Well, thanks to all our listeners for being with us today again. And uh, uh, look forward to the next episode of the Fourth Star Podcast. Thanks again, everybody. Mm -hmm.